Amen. Luke 13. If you got that, would you stand with us? Luke 13. And we'll see some uh, probably familiar scripture. And uh, tonight, Luke chapter 13. I want you to start reading in verse number 10. Luke 13, verse 10. If you're there, say amen. amen. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. I want you to draw your attention back to verse number 11, where there was a woman who had this inf- a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And uh, so for a little bit tonight, I want to preach on this thought, when you just can't straighten up. When you just can't straighten up. Pray with me and pray for me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. Lord, I pray you make it a blessing for us tonight. I pray you make this sermon more than it is. Make me more than I am. And make me a blessing to our church. I pray you'll encourage them. Lord, I pray you'll strengthen our faith in you. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And you can be seated. What we have in this chapter, in this passage of Scripture is... We've got a, uh, a group of people that are at synagogue or at church, if you will, and, and uh, we've got this woman who has had an infirmity for 18 years and it has caused her to uh, be doubled over and, and to basically have uh, her back bent over constantly and she cannot straighten herself up. And, uh, and she has been this way for quite some time and, and so Jesus is at church and, and there's this woman that has been over and... And uh, it says in verse number 16, Jesus tells us that Satan was the one behind this. And, and so what we have is we've got somebody in the church house who Satan has uh, afflicted for 18 years and, and she's not getting any better. And, uh, and no matter how hard she tries, there in verse number 11, it says in no wise could lift up herself. And so what we have is a woman in church who just can't straighten up. And I don't know about you, but my, I heard that phrase all the time growing up. My mama or my daddy would say, boy, you better straighten up. You better straighten up, straighten things up. And, and, uh, and you, certainly you can understand the play on words I'm making there. But what we, I do want you to see is not a play on words. In verse number 11, the Bible's very clear to tell us she had a spirit of infirmity. And so this bowing down issue was a spiritual thing and then Jesus is very clear to tell us that it was Satan that was behind it and uh, and so uh, you may not be hunched over tonight but you certainly know what it means to have Satan afflict you and to have a spiritual problem going on that you just can't get rid of somebody say amen and so there are three uh, uh, three main people uh, in this passage. I'm going to give them to you real quick, all in all at once. And these three are going to be the three points. But in verse number eleven, it says that she uh, was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And then in verse number twelve, Jesus saw her and called her to him. And then in verse number fifteen, the Lord answered and said, "Thou hypocrite." So we got herself, we got him, and we got this hypocrite. And those will be our three points for tonight, and, uh, and we'll see how far we can get into this uh, message. But what I want you to see in verse number 11 is this woman uh, had this infirmity, and she could do nothing about it. And so I want to see, number one, herself. Let's look at this woman tonight for a little bit, and I hope you can find some way that you relate to her. I know I can relate to her, because what the issue is, is she has a problem she can no longer hide. 
it is on the outside. And though for a while she's had it 18 years, and so you are all familiar with how physical infirmities go, they get worse as time goes on. And so there is a good possibility that when she first got this ailment or this sickness that uh, she probably walked upright just like everybody else, knowing she had a problem, knowing there was something on the inside that was making her sick and making her weak and maybe robbing her of her sleep at night. I don't know what all the uh, 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 symptoms might have been, but I do know that sicknesses like this get worse over time. And I also know that spiritual sicknesses get worse over time. And there is, a, there is a long period where you can keep that a secret and it is just between you and God. You can come to church and nobody really knows that there's something going on. No one really knows that you're broken. No one knows that you're hurt. No one knows that you're sick. No one knows Satan's on you. Uh, but you and God know and you can kind of keep it hid for a while. But by this point in verse number 11, it's been 18 years and she can no longer keep hid that there's something wrong with her. And so as she comes into the church or to the synagogue, I, 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 can, I can't help but hear the, the whispers. Oh, sister so-and-so is back again. I can't help but see as people slide over and don't want to sit next to her because she's got a problem that just can no longer be hid. What has happened is her outsides come to match her inside. Her outside has come to match her inside. And can I tell you with love in my heart that that's going to happen to you? What we keep hidden, what spiritual problems we keep behind our facade that we put on to come to church, that's going to come out eventually. And it will not always be able to stay a secret. And, and I wonder, I just wonder... I wonder what church would be like if, uh, if our insides were on the outside and vice, instead of vice versa. You know that uh, in 1 Samuel 16, the Bible says that man looketh on the outward appearance. God looketh on the heart. And so even though maybe you can come to church and keep a problem under wraps and keep it a secret and keep it hidden, guess what, my friend? You haven't hid it from Jesus. You haven't hid it from Jesus. And, and let me just say this as well before I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but Jesus was probably the happiest one to see her that day. Nobody else was really happy about it, but Jesus was really happy to see her. And Jesus calls her to himself, and Jesus saves this day and saves this woman and from this sickness, from this ailment, from Satan himself. And, and Jesus saves her. And, and, and so just because Jesus knows you have a problem or are a problem, that doesn't mean Jesus wants to get rid of you. And so what was going on in this chapter is this woman had a problem she could no longer hide. And I wonder, what are you hiding? What if your outward appearance was identical to your inward appearance? Charles Spurgeon said, if our outward ailments were to be set forth upon our brow, I can guarantee we should not linger long at the mirror. You say, what does that mean? It means if your inside was on the outside, you wouldn't want to look at the mirror very long because you don't even want to look at what's wrong with you, much less let everybody else look at what's wrong with you. So what if, just hypothetical, what if the outside was on the, or the inside was on the outside? What if the real you, the, 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 the you that only Christ knows, was the you we were all looking at. What if instead of ch Wednesday night church being filled with people that uh, are dressed for church and acting like they're at church and singing like they're at church, what if it was the real you that you left in the car? I wrote this little poem today. I'll read it to you. What a horrible scene the church would be if the real you could really be seen. And if a handshake and a smile could no longer disguise the death that you have living on the inside. Folks would run and shout with fear, there's a dead man sitting here. Sermons would be silent in the pulpit a coffin if the preacher's deadness were out in the open. 
What a horrible scene the church would be if the real you could be seen. Corpses fill the choir loft, dust dust and ashes in the offering plate, change the steeple to a headstone. It's not a church, it's a grave. Turn the harmony into agony and take away the songs, and why put Sunday best on top of dead men's bones? What a horrible scene the church would be if the real you could be seen. Visitors would run and hypocrites would condemn because nobody wants to go to church with them. But there is a merciful one. His name is Jesus. And he comes to church here even though he sees us. He knew before we got here what we were trying to hide. And when our inside comes to the outside, he's never surprised. A compassionate conqueror of our greatest foe, Jesus goes to church where the sick people go. And the greatest truth about this passage of Scripture is not that her problem finally came to light, but it is that Jesus Christ himself was willing to touch her, have compassion on her, conquer Satan on her behalf, and set this woman free. And she was finally able to straighten up. She was finally able to straighten up. And I don't know about you, but I I do long for the day when this robe of flesh I'll drop and rise and seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. And I'll be glad when the things that make me mess up are no longer there. I'll be glad when Christ does get me out of this bondage, this body of death that Paul talked about. Paul the apostle said, Oh, wretched man that I am. I mean, listen, I know ain't none of us perfect, but ain't none of us like Paul either, I would dare to say. And the apostle Paul said he was a wretched man. Why? Because this flesh that he was dealing with, he had a war in his members in Romans chapter 7 and And you and I can all bear witness with that. And one of these days, there will be an ultimate freedom. There will be an ultimate transformation. And you and I will become like Him. We will have a glorified body. We will not have a a sin-cursed nature, a sin-cursed tongue, sin-cursed eyes. We will not have any sinful memories. We will be washed away from everything this world has ever left on us. But I have good news. We don't have to wait until then to experience freedom. And you don't have to wait until heaven to actually straighten up. We see herself. I want you to see in verse number 12, we see him. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him, to himself, to Christ. Christ called her to Christ and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. How glorious a Savior to call the sick to him to get close to the ones no one really wants to be around. Like the song says, the ladies sing, is when everyone else walked out, that's when he walked in. And, and this woman would probably say amen to that as the, as the Pharisees and as the ruler of the synagogues had, had done nothing for her. She's been coming and coming and coming and, uh, for 18 years and they've never been able to offer her any help at all. The, ruler of a synagogue begins to criticize Jesus and he says that there are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. And like it was her fault that she got healed on the, on the Sabbath day and, and like he, they had was able to ever do anything for her any other day that she had ever been there. But, but Christ came in and called her to himself. And can I say that if you come to church and just get close to me, you've gained a friend, but I can't set you free. If you've come to church and you get close to to somebody else, then you've just gained a friend or a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, and I'm all for brotherly fellowship and that, that uh, camaraderie in the church house, but when you come to church, you better be coming to get to Him because He's the only one that can set you free. He is the only one that can straighten you up. He is the only one that can bind that adversary, the devil. He's the only one that can help us. We see His passion. His passion, it was... Jesus' idea for her to come to him. He called her to him. Verse number 12. He initiated this entire process. She didn't come to ask him. He looked at her, saw her, and called her out. How about that? His passion. He loved her. Not only his passion, but we see his perception. His perception. When he, Jesus saw her, He called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. First, I want to say that he knew her problem. He knew how long it had been there before he ever spoke to her. He knew her when he saw her. 
But another perception I want you to notice is in verse number 16, Jesus says, Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound? We wouldn't even know Satan was involved in this had Jesus not told us. We would have just thought it was another physical sickness that Jesus healed. Him, he did that all the time. He healed blinded eyes, lepers, and so on and so forth. We would not have even known that Satan was involved in this ailment had Jesus not told us. And ain't it just like Jesus to always know what the real problem is? It's all, Christ can always look past all the exterior. He can, look, he can look past all the stuff that's on the front, and He can look all the way down to the very root of the matter and see who's behind this whole thing. And, and Jesus Christ shows a great example of perception by calling out Satan's hand upon this woman. Now, you probably don't want to admit that Satan is the one behind your problem, but can I say that Satan is the one behind your problem? This woman may not have wanted to admit that it was Satan that was afflicting her and binding her, but Jesus identified the the root of the problem and said that Satan had bound her. Satan had bound her. Jesus says in verse 15, he's talking to those hypocrites, and he says, Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day, loose his ox or his ass. That's the same thing that he did for her. He loosed her. Satan had bound her like an animal. Satan had bound her. She was so restricted, but Christ came in, identified the root of the problem, not only his passion, his perception, but we see his his power. Satan had bound her like an ox, but he couldn't turn her into one. And in verse 16, he says she was a daughter of Abraham. And though she's afflicted, and though she is bound, and though Satan has done all that he could, well, that's just the truth. That's all Satan could do. He couldn't kill her. He wasn't allowed. He couldn't take her will from her. He's not allowed. He couldn't take grace from her. He's not allowed. There are limitations placed on Satan. He can only go so far. The book of Job is the perfect uh, proof text to show us that Satan has under authority. He has limitations from his creator. He has a maker just like you have a maker. And, and he has a boss just like you have a boss. And he has a supreme authority in the universe just like you and I have a supreme authority in the universe. And though Satan had done all he could to this woman, that's all he could do. He could just bind her. He couldn't take away her heart. He couldn't take away her grace. He couldn't take away her will. He couldn't take away her her faith. He could not take that away from her. And then in verse 16, he's met his match as Jesus Christ has set her free. She is finally able to straighten up. What, what, What would your life be if you could finally straighten up? She's doubled over. You know what that means? She's only half of what she's supposed to be. She's only half as tall as she was born to be. She's only half as strong, half as quick as she's supposed to be. But in just a moment, she's been set free and she can straighten up. And oh my goodness, how life would change. My soul, how life must have changed. You know, 18 years... If you're a young teenager, in the funnest years of your life, 18 years goes by like that. Scott, you're going to be 18 before you know it. CJ, you're going to be 18. Trevion, you're going to be 18. Getting out of high school before you know it. And it's going to be gone. And your mama's going to cry. We went to Mason's kindergarten graduation, and we was watching him graduate. And I I told myself, I said, it won't be, it'll feel like just a few minutes. I'm going to watch him graduate again. Eighteen years goes by so fast when you're young and having fun. But eighteen years seems like eternity when you're sick. You know, it doesn't matter how beautiful the floor is. That's all you ever get to look at. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how beautiful the, the, the building is. If all you can stare at is the floor... Mm. 18 years be a long time to be bound. 
Well, we see herself, and I hope you can bear witness with her. We see him, we see Christ. But I want you to notice lastly, I want you to see in verse 15 the, the hypocrite. And Brother William, I, I honestly wish in my heart, I honestly wish in my heart that the chapter would have just ended right there on verse number 13, where immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Man, it would be great if we could have stopped right there and go on to the next thing. I mean, just... But I didn't write the Bible. God did, and God's an honest man. And so this hypocrite business had to be thrown in to the story because they put themselves in it. Verse number 14, the ruler of the synagogue answered. He answered. Well, I find that funny because I don't see anybody asking him anything. Nobody asked him, hey, can this, is this, can she be healed today? No, nobody asked this guy a, a stinking thing. But he he is so enamored with himself and with his opinion and what he thinks. He really believes that he has to put his two cents in. Now, what is this man? What is his title? Y'all look at it. Tell me what it says. The ruler of the synagogue. What's that mean? Oh, Lord. Hmm. What's that mean? It means he's in charge in the synagogue. Positionally, He's in charge, kind of, like, kind of like a pastor kind of sort of thing. Y'all understand? So he is in charge. Well, that's funny because he's in charge, but Jesus Christ, the head of the church, is in the room. Amen. <laughs> and now we've got this power struggle between ruler of the synagogue and the son of God in the same room, and we got this helpless woman who's been bound and can't straighten up for 18 years, caught in the middle, and Jesus steps over this guy because really he ain't nothing and heals this woman, and this guy gets upset because he has been usurped. Christ has stepped over him, and he has been bypassed. He has been made irrelevant. He, his power doesn't mean anything, and his title did not do anything, and oh, what are we going to do? when we're no longer in charge in church. Well, we begin to say stuff that's really dumb. And we begin to say things that are a direct revelation of our heart. We begin to say things that if we get called out for it, we're going to be really embarrassed. Bible word is ashamed, like verse number 17. We are going to be found out as not the people of God, but verse number 17 Here's a very offensive word. All his adversaries. <laughs> uh, uh. We will be found out not to be the people for God, but the people against God. Ooh. And he says, which one of you wouldn't loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to water? You know why you would do that? Because if you don't, it's going to die. If you don't let it get water, it's going to die. And so they make an exception to the Sabbath rules to be able to loose their ox or their ass and lead it to watering because if they don't, it'll kill it. What's the righteous man regardeth the life of his beast? Is that what the text says? So in order for them to be righteous, they have to at least care for the necessities of their beasts. Yet he can look at someone afflicted in the house of God and, and still in his mind stay righteous without caring about their needs. Well, this don't even make sense, Brother Bo. This is just, where is this guy coming from? And Jesus begins to rebuke him and literally embarrass him. Because rather than glorifying God with her in verse number 13, he comes up with another rule. You only come to be healed six days. He degrades Jesus Christ to a man. He says six days ought men to work. Well, Jesus Christ was a man, but he was a whole lot more than man. He was 100% God in the flesh. So he degrades Christ, 
all of this because he got usurped. He got bypassed. Somebody went over his head. It embarrassed him, and it grieved him, and it made him mad, and it showed who was real colors. He's an enemy of God. He's God's adversary. And I just wonder how many churches are filled with adversaries. You've got the afflicted there and this woman. You've got the almighty, and then you've got the adversaries. These three groups, they're in church every Sunday or even in church on Wednesdays. The afflicted, the almighty. Oh, thank God he still comes to church. Thank God that he still comes to his own house where there's a bunch of afflicted people and even when there's adversaries there. I get told all the time, oh, God can't do anything in that church because of so-and-so. Well, I don't know because here is Satan's in this church and his adversaries are in this church and he radically just healed a woman in front of everybody. So I'm pretty sure he's always been bigger than the adversary. Pretty sure he's always been bigger than the adversary. Well, I don't know where you fit tonight. I hope you're not the hypocrite. Afraid of look, someone going over your head or your authority. I hope you're not like the hypocrite who would rather see someone stay bound in Satan's grip than violate a tradition that man set up. You say, no, 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 God made the Sabbath. Well, God didn't make the Sabbath. That is true. God didn't add all them fences that they added to it. God didn't add that. All them rabbinical rabbi fences and rules that they set up, used to know how many they had set up. It was an unbelievable number. God didn't make them up. Man did. God never broke his own law. You remember that passage where the disciples were getting that corn? Remember, that? Remember when David went in the temple and ate the showbread because his men were starving? You remember? The hypocrites. You know, I know God's had to call me a lot of things. He's had to call me a sinner. He's had to call me a rebel. He's even had to call me prideful. I hope he never has to call me a hypocrite. He will have to call us a lot of things. In order for him to call us son, he'll have to call us a lot of things. But I hope he don't have to call us hypocrite. And like this woman, we struggle to straighten up. I don't know what your thing is. We all have a thing that bows us over. We all have a thing. Hebrews talks about that besetting sin that does so easily beset us. We all have the thing. I don't know what your thing is. I don't know what that sin is that you've confessed more than all the others. I don't know. But you know and God knows. And if you don't stop, eventually everybody will know. What did we preach a couple weeks ago? God is a revealer of what? Secrets. He that, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And if we hide it and hide it and hide it long enough, it's going to come out. It's going to come out. The hypocrite. When you just can't straighten up, and sometimes it's hard, and no matter how many times you come to church, this woman's been faithful for 18 years, and it ain't got no better. No matter how many times you come to the altar, and you come, and you come, and you come, and you come, and you just can't straighten up. Luke 13 is a wonderful passage to tell us that through Christ, He can straighten you up.